Okay, so hello everybody. This is so exciting. We are finally here together to celebrate uh, the, the life and legacy uh, of Mars Rock. We're so excited. All of you are here. It's almost like a family reunion. Uh, I know that there are lots of people that are in other places as well. You traveled far. You got here. We're so excited about you all being here. Thank you. Uh, so we have a little bit uh, of kind of a plan for the day, but there's going to be a lot of kind of informal conversation, we hope. Um, we're starting with around 40 minutes or so of us talking about things, things we like, things we appreciate, things we'd like to explore uh, around the collection. And then there's going to be a panel discussion, and you got all those amazing people around the table mm -hmm. to kind of lead us into you know, the discussion there. Uh, so uh, we also record uh, everything today, so we picked up this room especially to make sure that what we're saying today is available for people that are not able to join us or other people that want to just kind of enjoy what we're talking about later. Uh, and uh, thank you all for coming. This is great. So I have a few words myself. Uh, I'm Boaz uh, Nadav Manes. I'm the university librarian in Lehigh University Library. Um, and I wanted to say, dear friends, colleagues, and guests, uh, dear uh, Chris and David Grace, uh, descendants of Mars Rock, uh, the family, your loved ones, uh, we are honored to have you all here with us today to celebrate the life of Mars Rock, the person, and his legacy. Uh, to our guests who came from near and far, welcome to the Lehigh Valley, uh, to Bethlehem and to Lehigh University, this is the place that Miles Rock loved so much. <laughs> so we are really honored that you're all here today. Um, in February 8th, uh, 1862, in the middle of the Civil War, Miles Rock wrote to his brother, Edward Rock, you hope the war will soon be over and we will see each other. I have very strong doubts about it being over for a year. However, when it is over and I live, I shall rejoice to come to Bethlehem and botanize over the beautiful hills around Lehigh. We invite you all uh, in the coming days to follow Ma's advice, rejoice and botanize, exploring this beautiful campus and its surroundings. Uh, as a university librarian in, Le in Lehigh, when such an opportunity arises uh, and the decision needs to be made if we accept a donation of such a scale, uh, we often hope and sometimes pray uh, that what seems to be a golden opportunity for us to reconnect with our past to the benefit of our future will be a wholesome experience, such that will allow us to learn about the past but also confirm <coughs> and sometimes challenge our current beliefs and deeds and strengthen our values going forward. Honestly, you never know until you see the collection. The past is indeed complicated, and so is our present. Alignment between the undying urge of research libraries like ours to preserve and protect legacies, stories, and motivations often conflicts with other values very dear to us and communities we serve. Still, we choose to collect anyway. This is what librarians are all about. We are here to provide authentic and accurate information uh, freely to anyone who likes to learn, explore, and grow, no matter what their orientation of views are, even when past stories are difficult to understand or agree with. In the past year and a half, and since Lois and I first connected with Chris and David Graves, and as our librarian staff, faculty, and students began to immerse themselves in the Mars Rock collection, many of us became real fans of the person and his legacy. You see us all growing beards and like having shirts with <laughs> <laughs> birds and, and everything. And we, we look like him more and more. Uh, <laughs> uh, beyond the facts about his global exploration and his success in becoming a self-made man, starting from humble beginnings, we learned much about his inner thoughts, his curiosity about science and arts, and his interest in advancing causes of social justice, work and racial equity, as well as his deep and rich connections to his friends, family, and to Lehigh. We are proud with his legacy. David said to us, we were really hopeful we would find a place where it wouldn't get lost in a larger collection or some remote collection where no one knew about it. 
Chris said, Lehi was a natural first choice. We believe that you made the excellent choice. Uh, Lehi 2023 strategic plan, inspiring the future of makers, outlines three goals. Make it new, we lead with curiosity. Make it different, applying new knowledge to existing problems. And make it together, connecting with our communities and partners while approaching the world with humility and desire to serve and care for value and, and care for and value each other. In my, my mind, these goals written just recently with an eye towards the future are echoed and exemplified again and again by the Mars Rock story and his legacy. I think he would be very much approving how this institution intends to march forward. I'm so excited that you're all here today jo to join us to learn more about the man and his legacy. Of course, there are many people to thank for the events and activities leading to today. I would like to first and foremost thank our amazing, wonderful Special Collections team here uh, at LIAI for the deep engagement with the collection this far and making it accessible to future generations. If you're in Special Collections, raise your hand. <laughs> thank you. Um, also to the faculty and students who already partnered with us to explore new research directions and interests. We have two of them here, and we're very, very excited about you know, them talking about what they want to do with the collection. They're already working on it. This is amazing. You know, like We have it for a year and a half by now, and it's so cool to see work done already and kind of thinking what is the collection uh, in, in terms of present. Uh, also to our librarians and staff in the library and technology services, for putting all the events here together, uh, and to our university communication folks, alumni association, and the advancement office for the sheer excitement, expertise, and support all around about this unbelievable gift we acknowledge today. Last, I want to thank the Friends of the Lea University Library members and the board for ongoing strong support. Your help make us make sure that our libraries can continue to create, preserve, and share the wealth of knowledge produced by this community. I want to introduce now our next speaker and partner in crime, Lois Black, uh, who has been in Lehigh since 2006, where she currently serves as the director of Library Special Collections. She brings rare book and manuscript experience from private, public, and independent institutional libraries to Lehigh to say a few words and introduce our speakers today. Thank, Thank you. Good afternoon. Please allow me to begin by echoing Boaz's words of gratitude and thanking the friends of the Lehigh Libraries. We appreciate their sponsorship of this exciting series of events commemorating the life of Miles Rock. This program and ensuing research opportunities wouldn't have been possible without generations of Miles Rock's descendants having had the foresight to preserve his papers and memorabilia largely intact, preventing his story from being lost to the passage of time. And what a story it is. Let me begin by describing this generous gift of Chris Grace and David Grace, great-great-grandsons of Miles Rock. They were the most recent custodians of Rock's papers prior to their donation and the archive to the Lehigh Library's special collections. David and Chris contacted the Lehigh Library's special collections and described over Zoom, we remember those days, but Zoom, the most amazing historical collection Lehigh archivists could imagine, the papers of a member of the first graduating class in 1869. The brothers generously offered to bring the collection to Lehigh, making the trip respectively from Massachusetts and Wisconsin. Chris and David regaled my colleagues and I with stories that had been passed down from generation to generation. We learned about the fascinating life of Miles Rock, who much like today's students, pursued an education and subsequently a career that took him around the globe. We learned firsthand through photographs, journals, and correspondence 
the story of Miles Rock, the only Lehigh student who have served in the American Civil War. The earliest material dates from his childhood in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and his studies at Franklin and Marshall College, his enlistment in the Civil War, and enrollment at Lehigh University. Also documented are his professional pursuits, beginning with Lehigh's hiring him as an instructor, a survey of a local zinc mine, and work as an astronomer in Argentina. Miles Rock's most famous, most significant professional accomplishment was delineating the border between Mexico and Guatemala. He died on his coffee plantation in Guatemala in 1901. We've learned more about Miles Rock thanks to generous support provided by Chris and David that enabled special collections to expedite cataloging of the archive. Casey Keyes, and Casey is here today, a PhD student in the Department of History, was hired to serve as a project archivist. Through the course of this work, Casey made a number of interesting discoveries that he'll share with you shortly. Casey also served as guest curator of the current exhibit on display in Lehigh's Historic Linderman Library and online, Re Rediscovering Miles Rock, thanks to Chris's and David's support. The exhibit includes maps drawn by Miles Rock, letters written between his family members, and examples of Miles' work as both an astronomer and surveyor. I hope you'll have a chance to visit and walk in the footsteps of Miles Rock. The exhibit is on display through campus in, through early July. And I, I know many folks in this room have had a chance to uh, preview the exhibit. You've seen portions of it in the main and third floor of Linderman Library. Uh, if you join us at the reception following, you'll have a chance to see material that's exhibited in the cafe gallery as well. I'd also like to take this opportunity to describe some of the teaching and learning opportunities students have had with Miles Rock Collection during the past year. Special Collections has presented classes such as World Stories, Fictional Expressions of Globalization for the Modern Languages and Literatures Department, and Power and the Planet for the International Relations Department. Students utilize the exhibit and then interact with primary source materials from the collection in our reading room. The Miles Rock Collection is one of the most significant archives to have been received by Lehigh University in the last century. Telling firsthand the story of a member of the first graduating class, consisting of only five students at that time, this collection provides current Lehigh students with measurable opportunities for experiential learning. The Library Special Collections is hoping to undertake a number of initiatives during the course of deeper investigation of the Miles Rock Archive, including potentially conservation, treatment of selected portions of the collection, enhanced cataloging of the papers to ensure discoverability and aid researchers in understanding aspects of Miles Rock's ambitions and life, digitization of the collection to facilitate access to researchers and lifelong learners around the globe, uh, potentially new acquisitions of related materials, such as photographs of Argentina, Guatemala, and other locales central to the story of Miles Rock, public programs and events designed to educate students, faculty, and the community about Miles Rock, and um, potentially the creation of a student internship or fellowship to perform some of the aforementioned tasks. I'm now pleased to welcome great-great-grandsons of Miles Rock Chris Grace and David Grace to the podium. After they each provide insight into their experience growing up with Miles Rock, PhD student Casey Keyes will share his reaction to the archives and highlight some of the discoveries he made along the way. Casey will also describe the process of selecting material for the exhibit, rediscovering Miles Rock. The archive is extensive and the exhibit has limited space. Finally, Devin Finn, visiting assistant professor in international relations, will describe the research opportunity she's anticipating as she delves into the collection. So I'll welcome Chris now to the podium. Thanks. Thank you. I'll 
be brief because I don't have, I'm not a librarian and I'm not a historian. <clears throat> um, so we'll leave that to the experts. Um, the one thing I wanted to remind everybody, or at least to tell the uninitiated, even though so many are familiar faces here, um, is to remind you of how, how unlikely it is that these things actually survived at all. They made it from remote, remote Guatemala in 1901 um, back somehow through a, it must have been a circuitous route, at least probably to New Orleans or Philadelphia or someplace, um, and eventually landed in Washington in the family home on Belmont Avenue or Street? Street in DC, <laughs> that's right. And at some point, they moved from what must have been either the basement or the attic there because nobody would want to live with all of this stuff in the middle of their home. Moved out to Laytonsville, Maryland, and they lived in a barn for a while, quite a while. Some of them were in the attic, but other stuff was in the barn. And then they moved to Trumansburg. I mean, it's just like this, except for DC, everything else is just a pinpoint on the map at best, and um, there, were, there, was, there were no floods, there were no fires, there was no mold to speak of, there were no vermin, there were no, I mean, there was very, very little th uh, that got to these things. So that's all dumb luck. None of us, that was not by anybody's design because nobody was stewarding these things. They were just, they were tolerating them at best. and and. <laughs> And, and the family had enough appreciation, there was enough understanding, vague understanding, you know, as time went on of, of his significance that people thought, well, we're not at least, we're not gonna just ship him off to the dump or burn it. We'll just, we've got space, put it in the barn. And um, so David and I realized that our children have, the chan very small chance of ever having space to hold this stuff, <laughs> let alone interest. So we needed to stop this cycle and, um, and make the logical step to really preserve them. So that's, um, that's what I would add, is just to remember when you're looking at this stuff, it, it's, it's, it's lived a charmed existence in the sense that it didn't, that the normal course of events didn't happen. They didn't, things, these really fragile things did not get destroyed. Um, so that's the good news. Um, that's, that's my point. So I'm gonna hand it over to David. I should start with a, an admission. I'm a materialist. Not, not in the, the sense of wanting to collect money, but I collect other things. I, I love objects. I'm trained as a historian, and material culture is, is my passion. And the, my relationship with, the, with Miles Rock was always through the objects at my grandparents' house. I'd walk in, and there was furniture, cutlery, um, China, uh, uh, oil painting of, my, of Miles Rock's mother. Um, these are all just everyday objects in the house. Um, Miles Rock's mother's dowry chest was, was a, a family heirloom. Um, his parents' fractures, uh, the, the, the Pennsylvania Dutch artwork celebrating their marriage, always on the wall if you look at family portraits or family pictures from a family, those are always in the background. They're always little objects that that connected us to Miles Rock. So it was something, I, it, it, to me, it was, it was material roots of, of our family, who we were, who, where we came from, just reminded, you know, the reminders everywhere you looked in the house, and they were all connected with my grandmother. It was all her family inside the house. Outside, the barns, the cows, chickens, those were all my grandfather's realm. That was, that was the Fry family. The, the, the ransoms and the rocks were in, indoors. <laughs> and and it, it, in college, when I went through, I, I had the privilege 
of going through the chests when they came to Trumansburg the first time at about it's my junior or senior year in college, and I was looking for a topic. I'd been nominated to, to write an honors thesis at Wittenberg and was looking for a topic and started going through these documents and decided, ooh, there's, there's a lot here. Um, narrowed it down to just the Civil War diaries, but I remember going through and, and seeing so much stuff, but it hadn't, it, I was still relating to it as a materialist. And giving the documents to Lehi has actually, it's, it's opened up new, new understandings of them to me. Uh, you, you guys have, have as you catalog them and made things, just going through the boxes when, when we gave them. Um, it was more documents than you were expecting. I, I believe that's safe to say. And after, after delivering, we came back the next day and we started just going through the, the, the trunks, opening them up in the room upstairs in the archives where we visited. And it, we quickly ran out of space. It was, it was or it was, it was hard to, you know, as we, uh, um, moved through the things. And it's at that point when I started to realize that, that by giving away these objects, we were actually, they were finally getting opened. They, they, we were able to possess them by, by giving them away. And that's something that I hope the other family members, the, the school, um, I hope everyone gets to experience that. Of, of now that they're at Lehigh, they're, they're available for everyone to possess. So. That, that was just my my addition here. So. Okay, good. I have prepared remarks uh, only because I think it wise to have uh, an exit plan should I begin talking about Miles Rock. Um, I came to this subject uh, through my work with Library Special Collections as a project archivist. So I was the person who processed and cataloged the Miles Rock collection, though I am in training and inclination, I should add, a historian. So while my academic work has thus far focused on questions of empire and nationalism in the 19th century Atlantic world, I have for the past year researched and written rather much on, on the subject of Miles Rock. So without trespassing on our time, I would like to give you a chance to hear the archive speak for itself. So I'll devote some time to what I think are some of the more resonant contents of the collection, and having, to, having come to know, in a sense, the helpful ghost of Miles Rock, I think it best to allow him to speak in his own words as we welcome him back to our shores. I should say, at the broadest level, that I perceive of history as a source of vicarious experience. So, The depth and richness, both in personal and epistemological terms of history, depend heavily on the quality, extent, and accessibility of archives. And although archives are the keystone of historical knowledge. They are, like the people whose sayings and deeds they document, flawed. What a pleasant discovery it was then to encounter such a rich archive pertaining to such a fascinating man, one that is so complete as this, so relatively without those flaws. The collection describes most broadly the life of a man born in 1840, died in 1901, a soldier of the Civil War, a Lehigh University graduate, an astronomer, a surveyor, a boundary commission chief, the list goes on. The collection contains essays, poems, diaries, correspondence, professional publications, photographs, memoirs, maps, books of astro astronomical and geodetic data, and more. In other words, if Miles Rock bought a toothbrush in 1895, we are likely to have not only the bill of sale, but a corresponding diary entry describing the exhaustion of the previous toothbrush. My first impression was truly one of surprise at finding how simultaneously broad and deep this collection truly is. There was also my continuous and ongoing pleasure and interest in learning more about this man whose letters and papers sort of always stacked in strings and bundles all around me as I worked. Chronologically, the collection spans Miles Rock's schoolroom essays to his funeral invitations well beyond, including many documents and letters from his wife then widow Susan Clarkson Rock, his rather exceptional children, and the Guatemala coffee plantation that remained in the family's possession for years after his 1901 death in Guatemala City. As I processed the collection, I naturally thought about it as a historian would or might. The work of a historian involves, I think, labors of empathy as well as intellect. Thinking about history entails a kind of effort in balancing these concerns such that 
they develop and facilitate each other rather than fall into a kind of strained apologetic or denunciation. The Czech novelist Milan Kundera described this perception very well, I think, in his 1993 book of essays, Testaments Betrayed. So you may know the quotes, a rather famous one. Man proceeds in the fog, but when he looks back to judge people of the past, he sees no fog on their path. From his present, which was their faraway future, their path looks perfectly clear to him, good visibility all the way. Looking back, he sees the path, he sees the people proceeding, he sees their mistakes, but not the fog. Miles Rock, as I'm sure you'll agree, has much to tell us, and this collection having been so, well, I was going to say carefully and devotedly maintained, but I should say tolerated uh, <laughs> by the family, and so generously placed at the disposal of posterity makes it possible for us, for historians and readers alike, to walk a bit nearer to Miles Rock in that fog of history that Milan Kundera described. In recent years, it has been the negative space, silences in archives that have magnetized historians. And even with all its scope and completion, there is also the occasional patch of desert in the Miles Rock collection. His time at Lehigh, for example, is sadly thinly, uh, thinly documented in the collection. So too his time with the Wheeler expedition west of the 100th parallel. The work of an, archiv or an archivist excuse me, and a historian do seem to me to complement each other rather effortlessly. Both of these pursuits, at a minimum, involve the organization of sources into a kind of retrievable coherence. But attention, of course, always scraped in the constant temptation to dwell for too long in the letters, the journals, the photographs, to read as much as possible on the Guatemala border question as I seem to see it unfold in real time, reading Miles Rock's diaries, reading his letters, Alas, I was not always able to resist, as I think Lois and Ilhan may, may be able to attest. But I do hope that the discoveries that I made in these instances will not only interest you for their historical perspective, I think uh, there's, there's quite a great deal of that, but will give you, as it gave me, a sense of Miles Rock himself, his personality, his intelligence, and his ability to express these in writing. So in order to do that, I will, I will devote what remains of my time to a brief selection of Miles Rock's quotations all discovered in the collection. His son-in-law, F.L. Ransom, remembers him after his passing by writing, it is not given to a much younger man who knew Mr. Rock only in his later years to adequ adequately convey the rare personal charm that was the delight of his intimates and made him an inspiration to all who knew and loved him. There was in him a certain boyish ardor that age could not chill nor disappointments quench. He was generous in the highest sense of that word and gave his best to those who needed his help. His scrupulous adherence to the high standards that he set for his own conduct never diminished the original warmth of his heart or contracted the flow of his sympathy. He looked naturally upon life with courage, courageous optimism, seeing many things worthy of the doing and finding his truest intellectual pleasure in the achievement writing to his brother Edward from the 1st Brigade of the Pennsylvania Reserve Volunteer Corps in July of 1862, Miles writes, Yours was the first letter I received after our many battles. You say, you had a great flood of water in the Lehigh. I had read of it in the papers. So we had a great flood here, but of blood. You have no doubt read all. The reserves were in four or five battles and fought nobly. It was a great slaughter a whole week, especially for the rebels who were mowed and mangled by the thousands. It was terrible, horrible. I suppose many volunteers will again come from Bethlehem, but you stay at home. It would kill you. Your lungs would not hold out two months. I wrote to Alan on July 4th and hope he has received my letter for mother's sake, who must have felt uneasy, as there was a rumor in Lancaster, as I learned by a letter from Harrison today, that I am dead. I can't think how it could originate. I am far from killed. God in his providence has granted me a few days longer life. My company lost four or six men in, in the battles, and that would be from a company of around 100 men, so a fair proportion. Writing again to Edward, from the same letter that Boaz quoted earlier, your description of Bethlehem was very satisfactory, and now I request that in your next letter you will give me a rough map of it, you can draw with the pen how the river runs and the principal streets and the locality of churches, foundries, etc. 
the island and the river and mountain on the other side, and shop you work in, also the railroad, canal, etc., and the schoolgirls and boys. Suppose you send me a Bethlehem newspaper once in a while. Give me the names of those published in your town. It must have been a good map, an advertisement of a kind. Writing to his brother John in 1863, I am glad, for your sake, that you have resolved to stop smoking. In after years, you will thank yourself for this manly determination. I know a young man here, in the 6th Regiment Infantry PRVC, who smoked. After a while, it was not strong enough. Well, he, he also chewed, first weak tobacco and then strong. Then he got used to this, and he craved something still stronger. And now, he uses liquor and is bloated. <laughs> to distinguish right from wrong on all occasions, always ask yourself this question. Would mother approve of it? <laughs> a caring and, and, and very faithful older brother. On slavery, Miles fought in the Union Army. I am reading Elements of Botany by Dr. Benjamin Smith Barton. The following sentiment occurs on page 38. Speaking of orza sativa, or rice, he says, but how greatly it is to be regretted that this vegetable in the most free and happy country upon earth should be cultivated almost exclusively by the hands of slaves. Shall we never learn to be just to our fellow creatures? Shall we blindly pursue the imaginary advantages of the moment and neglect the still but solemn voice of God until vengeance in the lurid air lifts her red arms exposed and bare? This day answers these questions terribly in the affirmative. The nation is rent and stricken. Our loved president is sacrificed, but the evil spirit is cast out. He writes this letter on April 18th, 1865, reeling still from the news of the death of the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. But what did Miles Rock have to say about Lehigh University and its students? Alas, we, we, perhaps more than we can tell because of the collection not having all that much on his time at Lehigh, but enough to give, I think, a sense. On January 31st, 1869, he laments, I am not with Sue today, who is to be his wife, because I do not want to miss my teaching on the last day of the term tomorrow. February 1st, 1869, the last day of first term and the last day of my teaching, for which I am glad. More relatable all the time. <laughs> Thursday, November 25th, 1869. Waylon misbehaved badly, and I reported him. The gas fixtures on the tables were destroyed. Tuesday, February 3rd, 1870. At 11.30, started for Bethlehem, and after dinner, got to college just at one. I found the class well-behaved and agreeable, and the three hours of teaching were a pleasure. Waylon has been again dismissed, for some misbehavior in his room. Payne was dismissed too. B. Miranda was before a justice this morning on a charge of being the father of a child with Nettie Casgill. It is a shame. On artificial intelligence, a man who was ahead of his time, when at Cordoba about two years ago, I read in the Atlantic Monthly an article about the production of artificial stupidity in our schools. He somehow got a copy from, I think, last year. On, uh, and, and to give you a sense uh, more so of his, of his humor and his character than anything, a remark upon his Boundary Commission colleague, Claudio Arrutia. That inflated bag of vomit, egotism and malice, on work and contentment during his time as, a, as, a, as an engineer for the Pennsylvania Railroad. While I am in a reasonable state of contentment, it is not the way that I would like to spend my life. I want to do a certain astronomical work I have planned, and I must also do something to earn a living. Oh, hard, cruel fate. There is no money in astronomy. I am disquieted to be so down with my nose to a grindstone, to have only one short life to live, and to be compelled to pass the precious time in drudgery to supply animal wants instead of doing what I like, it's galling. I can think of no occupation but teaching to give me support and also leisure to pursue my astronomical project. 
I'll leave you uh, for now with a bit of a letter to his closest male friend with whom he remained, I think, a very dear friend until Harrison McCreary died rather tragically. But leaving for Guatemala in 1883, Miles Rock would not have known what we know now, which is that it, it would only be on very rare and few occasions that he would return to the United States, that he may indeed never see his best friend, Harrison McCreary, again. Writing to him as he embarks on what he believes will be a year or two long expedition to delineate the border, but what turned into a lifetime and what extended beyond Miles Rock's death, he observes how time flies and very soon we'll all be buried and forgotten. The generations will go on, our nation will decay, other nations will arise and will necessarily be forgotten. At last, the very surfaces on which we move will be buried thousands of feet under new strata of rock, perhaps, or it will be eroded and carried to sea, and the places we walk now will someday be hundreds of feet up in the air in position with reference to the new surface on which new nations and races, if not species, will live their lives, important to them as ours to us, but they will not even suspect that we ever had existence. Except in digging, they may find a brick bat or bottle or tomato can to grace a shelf of some paleontologist or fossil anthropologist. What a puff of steam. Thank you. Well, I have the benefit of having just received all of this kind of fine texture and color and detail in um, hearing about how the collection has been preserved and tolerated, but also these deeply, um, I think, revealing and rich quotes and um, stories that, that Casey revealed, right? So I come to you not as a historian. I am trained as a political scientist. I teach here in the International Relations Department. Um, but, and, I've always chosen to conduct research um, sort of in an inter interdisciplinary way, right? In a way that crosses um, the aisle of different um, disciplines and methods. And so this is what I try to bring, you know, this kind of holism and dialogue um, is what I try to bring to my students um, and what I do, hopefully, what I try to do in my research. Um, so I'll talk just a little bit about how my students and how I've tr how you know engaging with historical archives and especially Miles Rock's collection, um, you know what what that can bring to the classroom and to Lehigh and and kind of this intellectual tradition, um, and then a little bit on you know the political context. Right? These are these were real disputes and um, sometimes violent political contestation over you know where dividing lines between countries lie at really critical moments of you know, post-independence, what we call state formation um, in political science and international relations. Um, so first, how can, students, um, how can students engage with historical archives? Well, first, you know, experiencing new kinds of evidence and identifying patterns in how events occurred and how they were connected, how they were interpreted, written about, um, contravened and portrayed, students can then sort of make sense of these moments in a broader analytical context, a broader historical context, right? Like post-independence Latin America, um, or the history of foreign investment, right? Um, second, drawing on the archive as a connection to humanity, right? Um, humans make history, right? Their passions, their curiosities, as we've been hearing about, you know, Miles Rock's expeditions, um, their biases, their personal loyalty, sometimes their flagging loyalty, their discontent, um, really shape what happens, right? Who wins wars? Um, where, who makes scientific discoveries? Where these um, boundary lines actually fall in the end? Um, 
And, you know, in all of my courses and with my students, I focus especially on kind of the, so the social nature, um, the deeply fundamentally social nature of politics, right? Um, and how politics work, sort of how the everyday, so gathering provisions for some field expedition, um, riding a train to get to the ship that would take Miles Rock to Chile, right? Um, negotiating the difficulties of translating an informal agreement made in the rural wildlands of Western Guatemala into a formal diplomatic treaty, right? All of these challenges that Rock faced. Um, those everyday moments really um, shape kind of the shifting sands and terrains of power and of connection. Um, so third, I think um, digging into the archives is a way for students um, and for me as an educator to kind of cultivate that moving across disciplines and that curiosity, right? How would a geologist look at this question? How, do, how does an historian, right? How would an engineer, um, a chemist, Right? So we know that Lehigh is a university of engineers, of biologists, and now increasingly business persons. Um, but also it's a university of poets and historians and philosophers. Um, and so for instance, speaking more specifically about the archive, when we look at Bethlehem Iron Company of Pennsylvania, um, their documents and photographs showing their investments in iron mines in eastern Cuba, um, in the late 19th, early 20th century, which are here, where they live here in special collections, um, we can consider that source from a few different perspectives, right? One is, you know, the role of the sovereign state in regulating foreign investors' activities, how they treat their laborers, the standards they're being held to, right? Um, in mineral rich but poor developing countries. Second, you know, engineers might think about um, those investments. Um, relationship to the built environment, right? And advances in technologies. Um, so, so what do we do? My students, um, with the Miles Rock documents, for instance, I ask students to visit the collection um, through guided sessions, kind of small um, four or five person sessions with the team of archivists. Um, and so that meant Lois and Alex um, and Eric and also Ilhan. And um, the assignment was sort of that they absorb elements, right, of the, of the exhibition and also of primary, you know, of documents themselves and put it in dialogue with some of the ideas um, and arguments that we're discussing in class. So this semester, as Lois mentioned, this was for a course called Power and the Planet, which is a new course that's never been taught at Lehigh, very exciting. Um, it concluded yesterday and actually, unlike Miles Rock, I was very sad to see it end. Um, not, can't always be said for, for all of my courses, but this one, that was definitely true. So it's an IR course, an international relations course on nature and politics, um, with a focus on sort of international policy and local efforts to build resilience to the effects of climate change. So as part of the, the assignments, the students engaged with details that got them looking, you know, sort of really closely at the maps, at dates, at the sketches um, made by Miles, Rock, and his colleagues. Um, at letters and government documents um, that populate the collection, right? So it made these kind of vague notions of state building and um, even armed conflict, right, and plantation agriculture sort of come to life, right, making them very real and personal for the students. Um, one student in, the, in this class, in the Power and the Planet course, remarked that on Rock's use of the phrase, my Indios, like my Indians, which would have been a common referent, perhaps, you know, during the era, um, by landowners uh, to refer to the indigenous laborers on the finca, on the coffee farm. Um, and so this student was sort of questioning Rock's economic and person personal relationship to native inhabitants of the area, including those that he had employed, right? Considering the fact, and Casey just discussed this at length, um, that Rock had fought in the Civil War, in, including in some very bloody battles in, in Virginia, um, a struggle that, as the student mentioned, brought to an end, quote, the ownership of people in America. Um, so for him, the question was, what did that experience of, of participating in, in such a, um, a meaningful war, right, um, what did that mean for Miles Rock when he 
years later, moves to Guatemala and owns a, um, a coffee plantation, right? The student um, whose family is, who's from Sudan, asked. Um, and so we know that Miles Rock was very committed um, to and rejected slavery and enslavement in all its forms. But um, that's just one example of, of some of the, the reactions and engagement with the, the documents themselves. So my hope is that students are prompted to ask, um, what might my path look like, right, as a Lehigh-educated professional, um, allured perhaps by work and investment and, and taking on responsibility in a foreign context, right, or even here in Pennsylvania or the American West, um, perhaps excited by this possibility of shaping local histories and community building and scientific advancements. Um, so the other aspect you know, of Miles Rock and his world, um, specifically his experiences in Guatemala that I wanted to focus on, is this idea of the state um, being constructed around him and certainly through his efforts, right? Um, and also sort of the relationships with nature and people that this role that he took on and his immersion in these sort of wild parts um, entailed. So again, seen from one angle, Rock is doing this work of building states in physical terms by mapping lands, delineating boundaries, um, shaping political relations both within Guatemala um, and, and between the Mexican and Guatemalan governments. Right? I mean, so we know that borders, right? if you've ever taken a politics or IR course, right? um, or read the news, we know that front, you know, this idea um, of fronteras or limites that, that is constantly you know, emerging from the archive, from the, from the correspondence, um, are immensely important um, in, in the conduct of, of international politics. Right? Um, these borders outline and limit authority and give the imprimatur of states mutual recognition to a specific government or regime's ability to wield force and defend its lands and people. Right? So that's the boring IR theory part. Right? Um, but in Central America, um, this is a process that's defined by state breaking, right? followed by state making. So um, a caudillo, a, a local sort of regional strongman, um, Rafael Carrera, led all of Central America's, not only Guatemala's, kind of struggle for independence in the early 1800s against Spanish forces. Um, he later carved out a s relatively small, very precise, um, state, which becomes, um, which becomes Guatemala, that he could sort of rule confidently without having to be concerned about major challengers or you know, waves of resistance, political um, contestation. Right? So Carreras was a strategy looking toward having a really strong export market um, and tightly controlled, um, very tight political control. Right? Um, so, you know, that independence movement is successful in the 1820s. By 1838, 1840, Central America, the Federation of Central America, had broken up into Costa Rica, Guatemala, Honduras, Nicaragua, and El Salvador. Right? So, you know, I won't go into details, but you can see sort of some of the changes um, that Miles Rock intervened in. Right? He had um, really concrete, um, exploratory, mapping, surveying, um, and also, frankly, political and diplomatic roles in shaping the lines that would become eventually permanent, right? And certainly his, his persona and his, his um, human influence played a role, right, in, his, um, in, in how persuasive and how, how much he inspired confidence in his interlocutors. Um, and so, you know, these are deeply, again, deeply contested boundaries. Um, Mexico was claiming, you know, it's hard to see, was um, claiming, like in the 1893 map, you can see um, to the north, to the northeast of um, Guatemala, you can see Chiapas. Um, you know, um, Guatemala was claiming Chiapas for its own um, for its own territory, and Mexico was claiming, you know, parts of Guatemala. Right. So there was concern. Uh, and deep investment in seeing the boundary, the actually delimited boundary between the two countries, change. Um, and that's why Miles Rock was sent and came so highly recommended to undertake um, this work, right? So, of course, you know, this wasn't just about increasing the amount of land under Mexican control or 
Guatemalan control, but it was about access to the Pacific Ocean as well. This was a time when the ports were incredibly valuable for what you know, local elites, financial elites and, and, and investors saw to, would be sustained investment by Europeans in um, these markets, um, these export markets, right? Um, this is also the time when there's a big gold rush in California and Australia, right? So the Pacific itself becomes incredibly important in terms of um, uh, transport and, you know, supply chain issues, right? Um, and so, you know, we know that rock was praised and acclaimed for having retained really valuable lands for Guatemala, right? Um, incredibly important political role there. So through the documents and correspondence between Rock and his fellow engineers doing this boundary commission work, we learn that nature and natural conditions frequently pose obstacles to achieving their goals, right? So we hear in the letters, we hear about haze and fog and intense sunshine and wind and boulders um, and extreme temperatures, unrelenting forested swaths, um, are all mentioned sort of in field notes as obstacles to the commission's exploratory and mapping work. Um, in James Scott's parlance, through these exercises of seeing like a state, through census taking, mapping, generating cadastral records, right, um, looking toward taxation, these early states, right, these nascent states, um, were, you know, through the wielding of a force, right, um, were kind of building their own power, but also through these measurement efforts, right, through mapping um, and through learning local dialects. This is a state um, that's building a, a in, its own, in its own perspective, building a modernist um, uh, government, right, and, and exercising um, through simplification, kind of ignoring, um, for instance, social uses of the forest, right? However, driven by the commission's objectives and certainly his entrepreneurial spirit, Rock himself shows, is, emerges as a naturalist, as an environmentalist, right? He was an individual who was sort of deeply aware, as many of you know, I don't need to tell you this, right, but I was struck by this, um, deeply aware and appreciative of place um, and the natural world. So for instance, we can see this in a joke about temporarily capturing, um, temporarily capturing an, armadil an armadillo and in, rocks, um, and in rocks sketching a toad in a ravine's crevice to include in a letter to Susan Clarkson Rock. So here you have um, Edwin Rockstro writing a sort of field from the field, and Rock is in another part of Guatemala saying, I send you for eye inspection an armado, which I think he's talking about an armadillo. We've just taken into prison. But it is only for looking at, because the Indians want to eat it. Um, so I knew that this was not an armed person, un, una persona armada, but he's talking about armadillos, which are actually various species of armadillos are native to this part of cent north central and western Guatemala. Um, so I found you know, deep enjoyment in this kind of appreciation, which is all over the archive, um, and in reading Rock's description of Guatemala's forest. So this comes out in a scientific publication, I believe, that um, the American Naturalist in 1888, not this, <laughs> um, in which Rock seeks to bring the reader along for a journey from the high altitude volcanic peaks facing the Pacific, down through the dry grasses and brush, flora and fauna, and the pines, spruces, and cedars, where he saw great potential for furniture making, but expressed concerns about the, 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 the practical ability to extract this timber always kind of looking toward the business, um, the business opportunities, I think, all the way down to sea level. Um, and he remarks at the outset of this article that he sees his task as laying bare the face of Guatemala. So immediately after a passage in which he discusses generations of Indians inhabiting the beautiful and balmy high plains of the country, cultivating corn, and beans, potatoes, um, and peppers, Rock notes their profound diversity of language and practice. So this is from this 1888 article called Guatemala's Forests. The many languages surviving to this day and mere fragments of tribes in isolated patches and often mixed would seem to show that many different peoples came here and took possession of the fruit of previous occupants. 
and were in their turn subdued or driven away from their mountain fields. Thus, the cupidity and necessity of races or classes is ever making turmoil and changing the established order. These people seem fixed to their soil like the very trees. Sometimes a village seems all that remains of a race, surrounded by other languages unintelligible to it. So observing the indigenous people's relationships with the land and mountains and their skills in agriculture perhaps lends rock insight into state formation, one understanding of state formation, this idea of the changing order of things. Um, so you know, to conclude, all the while rock is navigating social relations, economic transactions. I was very proud as a Philadelphian, as a Pennsylvanian, I was very proud to see that he bought pretzels in Philadelphia in 1873 as he was pre preparing to go to Chile, packing them in his bag for Chile. Very, very proud Philadelphian. Um, and he's, you know, he's making sense of this all as a civil engineer, as an astronomer, as a father, as a husband, colleague, landowner, and also, as I mentioned, a kind of diplomat. Um, so this process you know, that I mentioned of strong men cultivating local support and indigenous peasants carving out an existence after colonial devastation and, and, and victimization is in fact deeply driven by external influences like European built railroads and investment in inks and tree resins and coffee. But it is also a story of being rooted in soil and lava, measuring the distance to the stars and marveling at the mist in the highlands. Thank you, Miles Rock. Okay, um, do you hear me okay? Yes, awesome, thank you. So uh, we got like around half an hour until we wanna kinda start rolling back to the Linderman to, for a reception. Uh, we thought of kind of having a little bit of a discussion and then open it up for you all to ask questions. Uh, Eric, where are you? Thank you, Eric. <laughs> Eric has the mic. Uh, so once we are getting into that, Eric will find you. Here, we have a question already, please. Question. Yes. yes. So, uh, Would you mind waiting for a second yes. just that Eric will? Uh, ah, Eric, Heather, Eric thank you. you. He was that allows us to record what you're asking. Oh, okay. okay. I was just wondering about his work with zinc mining, since zinc mining was so big here in the Lehigh Valley, and um, it's kind of come full circle with uh, Lehigh now owns the land where I think he did uh, work zinc mining. So I was wondering about what you found in the archives about that. Here we go. <laughs> Yeah, my name is Mark Connor, and I'm a community advocate for creating a heritage park on that property where the uh, zinc, where the 19th century Uberoth zinc mine was. And uh, Miles Rock was um, I started as a student working there, and I don't not sure if he was paid or if it was some kind of uh, apprenticeship. But uh, after he graduated, he continued to work there in drawing maps of the zinc mine. So that's just not the surface, it's actually the underground workings as well. So the maps are very detailed. They show the open mine pit and then also all the, um, uh, uh, what they call uh, veins that were, or tunnels that were followed underground where the miners were going after the zinc rich uh, ore. Uh, so we drew, drew very detailed maps and they really became the basis for all the maps that were done in the 19th century. Uh, if you look at all of them, they refer back to the work that Miles Rock did. Uh, not only at the, there was actually five mines uh, in Freedomsville, uh, all, all owned or controlled by the Lehigh Zinc Company, who was his employer. And uh, so if you, uh, uh, he drew maps of all those, of, of all the mines. And uh, so they're very detailed, very complete. Uh, it sounds like that was the story of his life. He was a de detailed man who, uh, who was very careful about what he did and, uh, and, and had a lot of pride in his work, and it's very clear on the maps that was the case. Um, his assistant in doing this work uh, was uh, a Lehigh graduate of the class of 1871, uh, Henry Sturgis Drinker, who is a familiar name on campus. He was the um, fifth Lehigh president and uh, uh, first one until currently who was an alumnus of Lehigh. 
He was uh, Miles Rock's assistant. Uh, when Miles Rock would uh, leave Lehigh campus, he would go over the hill. Supposedly, they walked over, but my guess is they hitched a ride on a wagon now and then, but, but uh, went over the hill to the mines, which are four miles away. Um, Miles Rock carried the transit, and uh, um, uh, Drinker ended up with having to carry the, the, the transit pole uh, over, the, over the hill. So, um, so he was his assistant, and Drinker would credit, uh, because the only mining professor at Lehigh had quit, because Drinker was the only mining engineering student, um, either quit or they told him he didn't need him because he only had one student. He, uh, Drinker learned much of what he knew about mining as a mining engineer at the mines, and I'm sure a lot of that had to do with what he learned from Miles Rock. So, you know, that's kind of what I know about it. So. Thank you, Mark. Mark Conner is a friend of the University Libraries and an expert on mining and everything. And I think last week, was it, that there was a tour? Yes, um, yes. In fact, uh, Mark led a tour for approximately a, a dozen students and a number of staff from special collections to um, actually examine the terrain that Miles Rock so carefully mapped. And it was a great experiential learning opportunity for our students to get out in the field and actually see not only the, the landscape there, but also the president pump engine that has been uh, left behind. OK, we started with questions. Go on. <laughs> Do you have, here, let's, let's start maybe there, Eric. Thank you. Uh, how, how many students do you think have interacted with the exhibits? I, I didn't realize that you'd have classes around it, but how, many, how widely has it been seen? How, how else do students interact with it? You may know the, the grand total. This semester, my students numbered 30. So the entire class, uh, it was an assignment. It was a required assignment. Um, and it was right after spring break, so they kind of were like, you know, dragging their, their heels a bit and sort of like, OK. But it was neat to have them in small groups. It was sort of like, um, I've also done visits, which are also great, where we can have, um, you know, bigger the entire class at once in special collections in the reading room interacting. Um, but I think this exhibition, the way Casey designed it and the way special collections kind of worked on it and, and, and diffused it through the library, I think allowed it really catalyzed this kind of like small group um, and like conversation. And then they did some writing about it. They responded to questions. So on my part, this semester was 30s. 30 students, but I think there are more. Lots. Yes, I describe our instruction programs in special collections as uh, presenting content from A to Z. And you've heard about Miles Rock's interest in astronomy. Uh, you might say that his work sketching the birds, as represented in our Audubon case, is an example of zoology. So we do indeed teach from A to Z, and Miles Rock's collection is, um, is an archive that we can incorporate in classes across the curriculum. So I would say at this point, probably well over 100 students have had instruction sessions centered around the exhibit and uh, many, many different disciplines. Yeah, obviously beyond those instructional sessions, we have the exhibit that you, you've seen today. Uh, numerous people, I think, seen it already in the last few days. Uh, and there is another exhibit coming in the EWFM, so the other library we have that we're working on right now that's going to be opening tomorrow uh, with a lot of kind of more on the popular side, the quotations that we heard about today. Uh, we are very much interested in the community engagement with the collection, uh, scholarly and more. Uh, so uh, we are uh, going to continue to explore it and present it and make it public. We should mention, too, I think that uh, because of deliberate placement of the exhibit cases in such a public area in the library, we're not locking our exhibits away in special collections. Not that we lock anything away, but uh, the cases are in a very prominent location. And you think about how many students we have who are passing by on an average day. So we like to think that more than half of the student body has, at the very least, stumbled over the cases and become familiar with Miles Rock. 
where was the other? Yeah, can you say also who you are? I'm sorry I didn't ask the other people, so just, just introduce yourself. <coughs> Um, hi, my name is Nate Carpenter. Um, I'm here at I'm a, the editor for Lehigh University, University Press. Um, this is a really lovely presentation. Um, it it, it you know, uh, sort of saw unfold from boxes of documents stored away in somebody's basement or attic. We hear Miles Rock's voice come out, and then we hear, see how Miles Rock can get put into sort of a much broader international historical context. So I kind of have two-ish questions. Um, uh, the, I'll just start with the one. So maybe you could talk a little bit about what was significant about the collection when these discussions first took place, and has how you understand their significance changed? Um, and then the second question is, is you know, this is, this is a family archive, right? And so, you know, um, David had kind of mentioned that he, that he, in handing it over, you kind of, I forget how you phrased it, but you sort of gained ownership. But when I was listening to this, I also feel like the arc, it breathes, right? So, yeah. but also it's a family archive. So, I mean, were there ever conversations about what it would mean to take a family archive and open it up to the public? Thank you. Maybe I'll start and <laughs> keep it going. So immediately, you know, uh, when uh, Lois said something like, uh, there is this collection that we may be uh, kind of uh, getting uh, into Lehi. Uh, it, it felt very exciting. It was very immediate and quick uh, because uh, we knew a little bit about the collection. We had some uh, writings uh, uh, by David that we looked at. And you know, we, we thought that for sure the person has significance for Lehi. We knew that he has you know, been the first class, uh, of uh, students here, we knew that he was in the Civil War. We knew that you know, like there is some excitement maybe about global, you know, um, work that he's done. Uh, and also, I think it was quick that we talked with Chris and David, and we're like, okay, there is a connection here, you know. Uh, and uh, from there, it was easier to kind of think what we did actually was to bring the whole collection without even. You know, knowing yet if we're going to be receiving it because it, it felt like a really genuine, important collection for Lehi. And we wanted to just see it, you know, like we were excited. We wanted to see, we wanted to see how it Kick opens. Kick the tires. Up. Yep. <laughs> yep. Uh, because as we, you know, like we're kind of, because this is like you never know, it opens up and then there are lots of different things you never know about. So, uh, it was very immediate, at least from my end. <laughs> but like, uh, it was like the quick uh, kind of reaction. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Chris, Christopher and I had, had quite a few discussions just about how, how it would open it up for the family. Because when they were all in Laytonsville at, at the farm, that was the, the, the sort of focal point for the, the entire family would come to that house. Um, but when that didn't exist anymore, neither one of us could provide that kind of setting for it. Mm -hmm. So to have them come to Lehigh. This is a place where the entire family can come and look at them. We'll know that they're here. Um, so we did have that discussion. We, yeah, and we had, <clears throat> so David and I grew up in an academic home. So we both were on the same page, understanding the, um, the specific reasons, the importance of, of sending it to an academic library. Um, and what the potential was there um, for access. As for, you know, discussions about whether there was stuff in there that would be painful or embarrassing or somehow awkward to um, expose, we didn't really go into that, and uh, neither one of us wasn't a big we didn't feel self-conscious about it. I mean, if we, if we found in there that he had some kind of, you know, monstrous habit, or so, you know, that there was some side of him that, well, yeah, that's get in line. I mean, we've got a lot of we've, we've got a lot of uh, we've got a lot of ugly um, of ancestors. Everybody does if you go back far enough. So that, yeah, so we didn't we didn't really spend a lot of energy on that. We, it was mostly um, and. David and my mother had made um, initial um, approaches and thoughts about this 
um, many, many years ago, 20 or 30 years ago, initially trying to think about the process, and it just wasn't the right time. But um, when, when both of our parents had passed away and we really needed to dispose of a lot of stuff, um, then David and I, it forced the issue. And, um, and we were both at a point in our lives where we were prepared to do the work and, and make the decisions and um, give up some of the control, um, all of the control. Uh, all of those things fell in place and, and it's helpful that it was just two of us and we, that we were in agreement. There, wa there, wasn't a, there wasn't a lot of dispute. We, so once we, once we made the call, it went very easily. You know, we're, we're attracted by the collection. Uh, of course, the Lehigh collection is, as we've described, but uh, in special collections now, our instruction uh, always comes out of storytelling. We're looking for uh, a way to have a collection, an archive, uh, an instruction session resonate with students. And one um, aspect of our um, pedagogy now that um, students actually seem to retain <coughs> is that storytelling component. And of course, there's a tremendous story here, uh, knowing that um, he grew up not too far away in Pennsylvania. He, he fought in the Civil War. He attended Lehigh University. And like so many of our students today, his career took him around the world. So everywhere, um, I think across South and Central America, uh, then throughout the United States, uh, he's, he's fairly well traveled for uh, someone of that period. So for us, um, it's about storytelling and knowing what a rich story we had here. Uh, the collection is, is nearly complete, and that um, was, of course, most uh, attractive to us as well, because uh, archives often preserve autograph files. Uh, if you have a letter that just happens to have George Washington's signature, it's thought to be important. But you don't have the whole story. You just have one signature, and in this case, as, as we've heard from, from Casey and, and Devin uh, as well, uh, that there are many, many um, research opportunities. Hi, uh, my name is Hannah, and I'm a cousin to Chris and David. I have one comment and then a question from my daughter uh, that I'll help her with. The comment is to add to um, Chris and David's description of, you know, Chris talking about the generations of tolerating the, you know, these box trunks of things, um, and David, you're talking about remembering just these items being so present. I, I just want to, I feel that it's right to add that your mother was an incredible storyteller, and <laughs> speaking of storytelling, and I'm going to, I love your mom so much, um, and so some of my favorite childhood memories are like laying on the floor in your den with her just regaling me with the, just the amazing adventures of Miles Rock. Um, sorry, <laughs> emotional, but it really, she was a storyteller and she, for me, she kept his story alive. So I'm grateful for that. Um, Hannah, did you notice how much um, in the picture where he's standing with his two children, the daughter looks like my mother? Yeah. 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 That's, that, yeah. Um, that's Amy. Yeah. His daughter, Amy. Yeah. Um, and, and so, my, and then a question. Um, my daughter, Clara, she and both my son, I think they're so used to hearing about very, people with very specialized career these days. So it was very confusing to them to hear that he did astronomy, civil engineering, <laughs> surveying, uh, he knew things about botany, geology, and so th their question, and you can add to it if you'd like, but their question was, did he do all these things at the same time? How does somebody do all of these careers? How did you get from one to the other? And I don't know if anyone no can answer that, but it, it, was, it, <laughs> it, was, it was something that was, and I, I know you were speaking about kind of interdisciplinary studies, um, but to them, that's, 
somewhat of a foreign concept. So if anyone is, yeah. wants to speak to that, that was their question. One of the things, in the, in his, the things that he preserved from his parents, um, they're very much the religious community, the, the fractures, um, the, the dowry chest has, has Pennsylvania Dutch painting on it, it and his mother um, couldn't read, or she, she couldn't read and write. She, uh, she signed her name with an X. Mm -hmm. And the transition for him into sort of the modern world with the education, it, 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 it coincides with uh, measurement and science and so, much, so many of those jobs, the titles, astronomer, um, cartographer, geographer, they're all applying the same uh, um, uh, data collection mentality uh, of measure, record, um, map. Uh, um, so, so lots of the, although they're different titles, it's often the same activities. The, the astronomy uses the same yeah. angle measurements as the triangulation that he was doing out west on the Wheeler survey. Um, the chronometers that were used uh, on the, the, for the hydrographic office uh, surveying the coast uh, of uh, Central America and, and the U.S. He, the, the, the skills he learns with measuring time with chronometers there, he's using in Guatemala. He's using out west. Um, he's he's using, using in astronomy. In astronomy at the Naval Observatory. So they're all skills. They're skills that he learned here at Lehigh, but they're all part of that mo the modern approach where, where the, the world can be um, understood mathematically by measurement, um, and then using that knowledge, you know, to 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 uh, sort of command the environment. Um, so yeah, so they, there are many, many hats, but the hats are all out of the same material. Thank you. I'm uh, James Baxter, uh, also a great great grandson of Miles Rock, uh, and also an alumnus of Lehigh University, class of 1980. And I mainly took the mic because I wanted to commend you for making me Lehigh proud, <laughs> you know, for everything that I see happening with this collection. Um, I knew very little about, you know, Miles Rock, other than the fact that, well, he graduated in the first class, and my parents were thrilled when I came to attend Lehigh. So, but, uh, so I wanted to comment first by just thanking you for uh, really engaging with this collection and, you know, really as, as David put it, you know, bringing it to light so that everybody can see it, so that the family can see it, but also so that, you know, students now and into the future can also see it. And so that leads me to the question, and that would be, uh, what do you see as sort of the pathway going forward uh, with this collection? And also, perhaps, are there going to be perhaps fundraising initiatives to sort of help support uh, research activities uh, with the collection? Uh, yes, I, I think I, I had mentioned a number of uh, potential projects that we would love to undertake in future, and um, I, I can't help but refer back to my bullet points um, now that um, we recognize the need for some conservation treatment in portions of the collection, and uh, that is fairly labor intensive, um, whether it's about paper repair, rebinding, uh, some of the, the collections. Um, have, have needed some TLC, I think mm -hmm. we have agreed no over question. time. Yes. Uh, we have created what we refer to as a folder level inventory. There are various technical terms, and um, if we had, uh, let's say, a smaller volume of material, uh, specific letters here and there, we would be cataloging them as individual items. In this case, um, in the interest also of time, we've created a finding aid that has um, what we think of as a folder description. So it might be correspondence during his Lehigh years. Uh, there might be another folder while he was in uh, Argentina, another folder while he's in Guatemala. One possibility in future would be to provide more detailed enhanced cataloging that might um, detail specific letters within the folders. Um, we've also have plans for digitization. We've 
digitized, as you've seen ex examples in the online exhibit. And I guess uh, by a show of hands, I assume that uh, many of you have already browsed uh, the virtual exhibit that we have. Uh, that is um, just the tip of the iceberg regarding our digitization efforts because um, we were focused primarily on the exhibit. What we'd like to do is digitize extensive portions of the collection and uh, that would also reach a global audience. We've been contacted by researchers in Mexico who are interested in his work and um, I think the Guatemalan government uh, would also like to see some examples of his correspondence. He is buried in Guatemala. Well, I might be able to add a word on that point. I think mm -hmm. that uh, where the collection has its most uh, scholarly value is probably on that question of the dispute about the border between Guatemala and Mexico. <clears throat> Excuse me. That was a question that seemed to uh, create tensions even after the 20 years it took to settle it. So for example, the bag of vomit, uh, Arutia, that he described in the quote, wrote a memoir of the boundary question, and uh, that book was suppressed by the Guatemalan government. Mm -hmm. A kind of touchy subject, I think, because it involved, while Miles Rock uh, did such hard and good work in helping them to preserve uh, portions of their territory, that Mexico being more powerful than Guatemala was able to sort of get its own way more often than not in that process, mm -hmm. able to delay and defer things to its own advantage, and so uh, I think that it's only now possible, thanks to the donation of the collection, that real clarity, really uh, kind of a deeper and valuable understanding of the border question can be had because I had read a person's dissertation who was writing about that Guatemala-Mexico uh, boundary. And it was pretty clear that they were using Mexican archives because there was very little reference to Miles Rock. And what was there was based either on Arutia's memoir or on me the Mexican archives. And you just got a sense knowing that Arutia is not somebody who's really, they were colleagues, but certain rivalries within this commission as well. And uh, the Mexicans being sort of opposed for political reasons to getting this done a certain way, that it, it, it ends up being a sort of very narrow and one dimensional picture that you get, I would say both of Miles Rock and of the question because you simply couldn't know, uh, you couldn't have the vast majority of the documents that he had himself in his own possession. I imagine that some of them would have sort of duplicates and things like this in Guatemalan archives. But uh, his personal perspective, for example, writing to the State Department and saying, look, I, I've, it's taken me a long time to come to this view, but it does seem as though the Mexican government is not playing straight with us and that they don't want this to be mapped in a timely way. So I think that those perspectives are only just now for the first time possible to have or possible to get. And I think that um, it, it's even the case that people were interested in this before the collection arrived. So as Lois could tell you, uh, there was an email from a scholar asking about Miles Rock stuff at Lehigh because they were interested in the Boundary Commission. So they knew about him from that. I Googled him and found that he was, you know, he, there's mention of him on Lehigh's website here and there before the collection arrived because he was a, the first civil engineering graduate. But there is, a, there is an interest in that subject and I think that that subject can at last be sort of uh, done at the level that it should be done because of this collection. So there are others, but I think that's where its real strength lies as a scholarly archive. Can I'll just take a second and give a perspective from the donor's side. Um, this, for David and I made the, this is an unrestricted gift. So Lehigh has complete control over what happens going forward. There's, there's no restrictions at all on who can access it, what conclusions they can draw, as if you could control that. But, you know, people try. Um, and, uh, but we asked, you know, we asked that the focus remain, or that, that undergraduate access and experience be a large part going forward that digitization be, a, be a, a goal, and that public and family access always has to be available going forward. Um, and then I've heard recently from Lorraine, um, who's, she's the vice president, that um, they have established now a fund specifically for this. This is another thing we pushed for. 
Um, there, is a, there will be a fund that anybody can donate to that they can designate a donation toward which will support this collection. It'll be available to do digitally, you know, online, uh, to make it as easy as possible so that, so that you know, people who are interested in supporting the work can do that going forward. And it, but David and I have no role in managing what they do in the future. So they may want to, they may want to buy things, you know, add to the collection in ways of, with materials that are not Miles Rock, but are, that are related. Um, you know, to build it out, they may, there could be, we can't even imagine the things that they want to do, so that's why we don't want to try to manage it going forward. It makes no sense at all that that wouldn't be a gift. Um, but, but the most important part is that they do have a fund established now so that it'll, there'll be a way for people who are, who are watching this and are interested in the future, David and me included, because we'll, we're continuing to support it, um, that they can, you, that you'll know that, that what you contribute will go toward what you've seen today and you know um, online and, and in the cases. Thank you. Yeah, you know, just to add a little bit to that, uh, we we have the whole fa certain family members here, many family members here. I already heard that there was a trumpet somewhere. <laughs> that you know, like so, <laughs> and, and like another one of those facets that we kind of discover as we go about this collection that you know, like this, this um, not just the person but the storytelling about the person uh, keeps on going, and uh, we are very curious about folklore, about the stories that you're telling each other, about the family history. Uh, our special collections team is great in kind of collecting those and recording those because this is, it's not just one person, one time, a long time ago, right? The whole idea, we got together today. So the whole idea is to keep it as a living legacy and kind of think about the people that you are and the way that you relate to this person that, uh, that long ago. So kind of think about those things too. You know, uh, you don't need to give us all the stuff you know, if you don't want to, uh, you know, sometimes images, sometimes just talking with us, uh, all those things are great. You know, like we really want it to be a viable <coughs> program, a place where, you know, people can connect, uh, students can connect to the material in a foundational level. So the story, like the human uh, story is what really we're seeking and like, please do come to us and Tell us those stories because we are we're really curious about those things. In addition, obviously, yes, if there is a way for you to support the collection in any way, shape, or form, that's great. Helps us. There's a lot of stuff. <laughs> this is a huge collection, and and you know, like when when we got it, there were you know, like you never know what is, is inside uh, those um, uh, big containers. There's a lot there. Okay. That's a sign. <laughs> we had one more. <laughs> okay, one more question. Yes, please. Yes. Thank you. I'm Don Baxter. I'm a great great grandson as well. Uh, I guess my question is probably best directed at Casey. Um, as you went through the collection, what surprised you the most? What intrigued you the most? And what excited you the most? Uh, well, it was full of surprises, uh, naturally, it, be, it being such a large archive. I think the thing that surprised me most was, I think, its completion and the extent of it. So not only is there uh, an, an almost uh, complete amount, uh, like I've mentioned in, in, in my remarks, there's uh, some missing areas, uh, particularly his time at Lehigh, uh, his time on the Wheeler Expedition, items pertaining to that but not uh, documenting it fully. The biggest surprise was the extent of it. So from his boyhood schoolroom essays, uh, uh, essays on bumblebees, lightning bolts, nuns, things like this, <laughs> to uh, funeral invitations, to uh, bills of sale, uh, you know, things relating to the sale of the coffee plantation in the 1920s when his uh, daughter, who by that point is middle-aged, is, is finally selling it. The thing that most intrigued me, I would say, was uh, Miles Rock's personality, that uh, it's, it's relatively irrepressible in the archive. It, it, it's all over everything. He, if he's describing anything, he'll do it in a way that is memorable. He, he, he seems to resist cliched descriptions in his writing. Uh, and and that, that's something I would add to some of the things that were said earlier about the, uh, 
whether or not it was the case that he was really wearing one or many hats in his professional life, I think it, I think it is true to say that he was an, an excellent writer and, and a very cultured person in addition to being someone who did uh, sciences. There's, there's nowadays, I think, and uh, it's perhaps a shame that there's this sense in which the humanities and STEM fields are, are siloed and isolated from each other. Uh, whereas Miles Rock would never have related to that distinction, whereas uh, he was doing astronomy or doing uh, surveying, he was also reading the poetry of Robert Burns, and there's a mention of this in of the letter where Alfred, his son, goes to retrieve his effects and says, uh, I did get my hands on that copy of Burns that he liked to read at night. Uh, so little touches like that, he emerges as a very, I think, relatable figure and one who uh, it's very tempting and I did fall prey to this temptation to spend long hours just reading his letters and to me it, it was simultaneously kind of a, a a nice thing to discover that we had the Boundary Commission Chief's papers, his documents pertaining to his work but also his ideas about what was going on here, his perspective on it. I, I think a, a deeply intelligent and expressive man and one who uh, was as good at kind of expressing those qualities as he was at putting his uh, education to work in the form of those, uh, those, those more scientific projects. Um, also the kind of uh, depth of the collection with regard to other members of the family. So in addition to having letters to and from his children, his wife, brothers, uh, colleagues, people like that, we have letter copy books. We have copies of the letters that he sent out that he's painstakingly written down in a clear hand, things like that. So uh, really, in terms of getting to know a historical figure as well as one possibly can, I think that uh, the collection is extremely rich and that it would, be, it would be hard not to sort of find yourself magnetized to the, to the person who's just everywhere you look in it. So yeah, I hope that answers your question. Okay, we, we ran out of time. We could have spent like two more hours, I think. It was so good. Uh, thank you very much. So remember to go to the reception at 6.30, back in the library in the Linderman. Uh, we don't have pretzels, I think, from Philly. <laughs> but we have other great stuff there, and uh, happy to meet you all. Thank you. By the way, there will be a bus. Yes. And I, I, okay. Thank you.